Yeah, I don't think Mother knew about this. Uncle Marvin was strangled by his own beard. Yeah, you never saw it coming. And welcome to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth, on the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. And this episode is brought to you by BYU TV's Relative Race. Hey, it's been a long time since we've had Kenyatta Berry on the show. And you may recall her from PBS's Genealogy Roadshow sometime back. She's come up with a brand new book. It's the Family Tree Toolkit. And we're going to talk to Kenyatta about all all that's in there for you to learn from coming up here in about 10 minutes or so. And then later in the show, we're going to talk to a man named Gene Carruth. He's at the Family History Center in Phoenix, Arizona, where an interesting item was brought to their attention recently and led to quite the adventure. You're going to want to hear what he has to say. But right now, let's head out to Boston and the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org. It is David Allen Lambert. How are you, David? Hey, I'm doing good. How about you, Selfish? I am doing fine. You know, I, you've told me in the past that the David part came because your mother liked Davy Jones of the Monkees. Actually, uh, my sister had a crush on him, but uh, uh, <laughs> as the story goes, it's not right? my mother. Not your mom? Okay, so, <laughs> no, so no. your mom deferred to your sister to name you. Yeah, I named picked out of a hat, the old traditional way. You know, uh-huh. they, And that, what's that the Allen the part? Draw. Is the Allen an old family oh. name or something? <laughs> well, I wish it was, and Fortunately, it turns out I thought it was just a connecting name, like John Francis Mary Ellen David Allen, because I've seen David Allens before. Yeah, about two weeks ago, I asked my sister something about my name, and she said, well, you know who your middle name comes from. I said, no. She goes, Alan Ladd. Mom liked him. (laughs) Oh, okay. So sis got to give you the first name. Mom gave you the middle name. And dad gave me the surname. (laughs) And dad gave you the surname. Well, what a collaboration that was. Yeah, it's a, it's a little fun story. Now I can pass on to my kids. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's get on to our family histoire news today. What do you have for us? Well, I'm going to lead off with our good friend C.C. Moore, who we know was on 60 Minutes recently. And it's a good story on extreme genes. And it's entitled, Your DNA is Out There. Do you want law enforcement using it? It really brings up a good point, And C.C. talks about it. Uh, and I just want to ask you, how do you feel about your DNA potentially being used for uh, catching a criminal? Well, you know, I am a volunteer deputy sheriff, and so in, in my own mind, I'm thinking, well, why not? I know there mm-hmm. are some thoughts about uh, people overseas having their DNA used by some other police force, and, and these are choices that people have to make. But when you look at some of the cases that are being solved, you know, they're not going to be using this on, you know, people sticking chewing gum under a statue's armpit here. This, this is going to be for <laughs> murders and, and really yeah. very serious crimes, and I'm I'm all for it, just like Cece is. And so am I. I feel if my first or second cousin, or third cousin for that matter, went out and was a mass murderer, sure, if my DNA can help catch them, go for it. Yeah, you got to check out this story. It's on ExtremeGenes.com. It's probably the best story I've ever seen uh, written about genetic genealogy, and it's in Bloomberg. Well, my next story actually has to do with DNA as well. There's a great article also in Extreme Genes dealing with some of the shocking DNA test discoveries. And some of the topics include, of course, switched at birth, finding out that you had a brother you didn't know or a sibling you didn't know. How about the wrong baby at the hospital? Yeah, that happens, Uh, uh, unfortunately, more than we knew. Mm-hmm. Finding out that you're Native American. Finding out that your neighbor was your father. Yeah. <laughs> so, these are some really fun stories. So I really uh, think that people should get in there and read this. It's just another reason to visit ExtremeGenes.com. Yeah, it's a whole bunch of stories there. It's like 20 of them, but they're only like a paragraph each. And mm-hmm. each one of them is a tasty morsel. So sink your teeth into that one. And if any of our listeners have something that's even better than any of those 20, please contact Fisher or myself. We'd love to have you on the show. <laughs> yes, we, we'd love to hear that. It is amazing that the variety of things that come from DNA testing. In fact, it seems to me right now that scientists out there are starting to go in a whole new direction with DNA. You're right. They are going in so many new directions. You know, a pet at home may be part of a project. There is now a new effort to go and sequence out the DNA of animals on Earth to record an enormous genetic
genetics project. And this is exciting to think that, you know, Fido down the street could be cousins with a Fifi across the street. You know, <laughs> that happens all the time, David. We don't need DNA for that. Yeah, when the dog busted out of the yard, and then you're getting the paternity suit from the neighbor yeah. because of the new puppies. And the puppies were switched at birth. Who knew? I know. Right. I mean, exciting <laughs> DNA stories will be on our pets soon. This is great stuff. I know. And, and by the way, they're also getting into plants with this. They're trying to do all the genomes of all these creatures and, and plants all around the world. They're not getting into bacteria, though, because they say that would just take thousands of years. Well, doing plants, it really proves they are branching out in the field of Ooh, genealogy. <laughs> very bad. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Oh, wow. you're welcome. Next, I want to talk about a story that goes across to the Emerald Isle, where thousands of new Irish family records are now being added. The Irish Genealogical Research Society has improved and increased their research records. They have over 14,000 names, which now brings three databases they have combined to over 270,000 names to search. Yeah, and this is great, too, because many of these are from obscure records, meaning that you're going to find things in there that are missed by the larger records, like the censuses. Of course, so many of those are missing in Ireland. So it's really great to hear constantly improving news from the Emerald Isle because so many Americans have Irish ancestry. As do I. My blogger spotlight this week shines across to the British Isles, where the blog of Karen Cummings, which is located on professionalfamilyhistory.co. UK slash blog. And she has a great recent set of articles on demystifying DNA. Sort of like DNA 101. This is not something obviously CC Moore needs to read or Blaine Bettinger or anyone. But if you're new to it or you're mystified by DNA, why not take a surf over to this website and check out this blog? Professionalfamilyhistory.co.uk slash blog. Hey, by the way, if you're not a member of NEHGS, you can join by using the checkout code Extreme and save $20 on AmericanAncestors.org. All right, David, thanks so much. We'll talk to you again next week. All right, my friend. And coming up next, you'll remember her from PBS's Genealogy Roadshow, Kenyatta Berry talks about her new book, The Family Tree Toolkit. That's coming up next in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Hi, Genies. Fisher here, and so excited to see so many of my friends finding out about the joys of Restore from Vivid Picks. Now, Restore is some great software developed by my friends Rick and Randy, longtime photo people, used to work for Kodak, and they've come up with the easiest, fastest way for you to improve your photographs for Mac or for Windows. They can create them in JPEG or TIFF files, and all you have to do is put a scanned photograph through their software, push one button, and And they give you nine choices of dramatically improved pictures. So imagine if one of your favorite pictures is fading or the contrast is off or the color has changed. One press of a button can bring that photo back to life. Take the Vivid Pics Fix with Restore for free. Right now, go to vivid-pics.com slash extreme genes and fix 10 of your pictures. I promise you, you're going to love it. It's Restore from Vivid Pics, vivid-pics.com slash extreme genes. Did you know that Family Search Family Tree is available through a powerful new mobile app experience? That's right. Now you can view, edit, and even add information to ancestors in your family tree whenever and wherever you are. You no longer need to wait to get home or make a date with your computer to view or update your family tree. You can add details to your tree when visiting with family or when capturing details from a trip to the cemetery. You can share new family history discoveries from classroom settings. Settings. You can even make the most of your time when waiting for doctor appointments or car repairs. Get started today by downloading the free Family Search Family Tree app to your Apple or Android device. Visit familysearch.org slash tree app to get the Family Tree app for free. Exploring and expanding your family tree has never been more convenient. Visit familysearch.org slash tree app to download the Family Search Family Tree mobile app today. 
Hey, Gene, it is Fisher here, and have you been watching BYU TV's Relative Race? Yeah, it's a show just perfect for us, and you're going to love it. If you haven't seen it, you can get caught up. You can binge watch using the BYU TV app. It's absolutely free, and you can watch on BYUtv.org. Now, this past week was day eight in the 10-day race, and all three teams met relatives, had great times meeting them. They went to batting cages. One team took a pontoon boat ride, and another in enjoyed a family recipe from a deceased relative. And while one team is now safe going into day 10, it's possible that one other team will be eliminated or all three will make it to day 10. See the past episodes on BYUtv.org or through the BYUtv app and watch this coming episode on BYUtv this Sunday night at 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific. Catch all the emotion, all the entertainment, and all the drama this week on BYUtv. It's Relative Race. Welcome back. It's America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. And this segment is brought to you by Legacy Tree Genealogists. Go to LegacyTree.com. And it's been a long time. I don't know why. She's been a very busy lady the last couple of years. But uh, my good friend Kenyatta Berry is on the line. Well-known genealogist, slave researcher, expert in so many areas of genealogy. And she's come out with a new book. How are you, Kenyatta? I'm great. Thanks for having me on. Boy, you've been a busy lady lately. I mean, I'm just looking at the title of your book. I'm thinking it took you a month to write the title. It's <laughs> it's just really, it's like five pages. Let's see, the Family Tree Toolkit, a comprehensive guide to uncovering your ancestry and researching your genealogy. It's, it's really long. Yes, yes. Well, I will give credit to the publisher for that. Uh, that was a great <laughs> title. I just wrote everything inside of it. So <laughs> well, That's awesome. And you, you cover a lot of ground. Now, you're known largely for amazing expertise in slave research and African-American research. But this covers everything and everyone, and it's very much a 101 book, isn't it? It is. I wrote it with the beginner in mind. You know, I thought about when I started genealogy over 20 years ago, right, what tool or workbook or handbook I would want to have to help me on my journey to discover my family history. And so I wrote that. I wrote the book thinking about the person that gets their DNA results and all of a sudden they have more questions. What book would they want to pick up and how could I guide them on that journey of discovery? Boy, that's awesome. You know, I think about that. You started out in genealogy. You probably never imagined you'd be on Genealogy Roadshow on PBS. Never imagined you'd be doing a book tour now, as you've done. I mean, it's quite the life. It is. It is quite the life. You know, I have, um, and we've spoken so many times before, and as many people know, while I was filming Genealogy Roadshow, up until last year, I was working full-time in software sales. And filming the show on the weekends, and I wrote the book while I was still working full time. So that was a bit of a challenge, but I got through it. And last year I decided I really wanted to make this book a success. And the way to do that was to put everything I had into promoting it, to doing more around genealogy and speaking. And I thought, you know, you spent so much time writing this. It would be a disservice to you if you didn't go all in on it. So I left my job in December, and here I am almost a year later, and the book came out, and I'm very excited. Well, what I like about it, too, is you not only cover the how-tos of genealogy for people who are just getting into it, but you include a lot of stories in there as well, which is really kind of what we try to do right here on Extreme Genes. We talk about various techniques, but what are the stories you've found as a result of those? So let's hear a couple from your book. Yes, yeah, so I start the book out with my genealogy journey, focusing, I balance both my maternal and paternal ancestors, right, and sharing information about them. But the book starts with my maternal ancestors who were in Culpeper County. They were enslaved in Culpeper in Madison County, Virginia. And they actually migrated, my third great grandfather, James Philip Sellers, and his wife Emily, and their children migrated around 18, I'd say 1885, 1886, to upstate New York. To a little town called Leroy. Now, basically, this is near Rochester, so they're closer to Detroit than they are to New York City, basically. Right. Um, and what's interesting, what I talk about in the book as well, is about two years ago, in 2016, I was on sabbatical, and I had also been going to promoting Genealogy Roadshow. 
So I went to Rochester because I know I had relatives in that area. And that's where I met a couple of my relatives. And I talk about how we met, so how I started in Culpeper, right, and then how I eventually saw the descendants, my cousins, of the Sellers family and met them in 2016 in probably around April-ish and then went back in November for the 125th anniversary of the church my family has been attending since it was founded. And there I met more cousins. I was able to attend the service and all the events for the weekend. And it was really cool for me because my great-grandmother, Esther Lewis Kendrick, died there in 1983. And since then, there really hasn't been a connection between her family in Detroit and her family in upstate. So I'm hoping to bridge that connection. Wow. And I love the way you're tying that in. And it is a chain reaction, isn't it? You find something in a record, you follow it up, then you meet living, breathing people that are tied to that record that you discovered. And that's what's so fun. I think this is the closest thing we're ever going to get to time travel. Yes, I totally agree with you on that. It is. It is absolutely the closest thing. And I love that in in finding these folks and connecting with them, I'm also able to bring their family history to life, right? Because a lot of my cousins didn't know any, any of this information. So when I first met them in 2016, they're taking pictures of my PowerPoint slides. And I'm like, I can give you the entire family tree. I mean, I've been doing this for 20 years. <laughs> We're related. But they had no idea. You know, cousins that grew up in the same town, not knowing each other, were connecting because of my book tour in Rochester. So I was in Rochester again on October 30th, promoting the book and meeting with family. Wow. So over and over, you just keep going back at this point. I do. I do. Because I find that it's great. The thing I love about Rochester as well is they've been really supportive of WXXI, the PBS station there. And after my appearance, they are actually rerunning seasons one and two of Genealogy Roadshow. Oh, how fun. So I really love going there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's talk about some things that are in this book, some resources that are kind of unique to what you're doing. Because I know right now, according to Thomas McKinty in Chicago, yours is the number one book in genealogy right now. Uh, yes, so I hear, <laughs> um, which is exciting. I think one of the things that is unique, as I mentioned, right, what would I want when I started? What would be a great thing to have? And one thing that was painful but yet critical to, for me is the vital record section. So I've created state-by-state state charts that list basically when state registration started for birth, marriage, death, and even divorce records, as well as online availability. Now, I did not, even though it seemed comprehensive, I did not put every online resource, right? I tried to do a mix of resources from multiple sites. And then as well, I included restrictions that a researcher or a family historian may face in trying to uncover their family history, right? As we know, the laws yeah. constantly change. But that was one of the things that I felt was critical, and it was unique, and cross-checking it and fact-checking it was painful. But I think it, it turned out very well, and I use it all the time, so I know that I did the right thing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and that's right. You've obviously put together something that's very comprehensive here around the country, and that's a great resource. It's just not out there in any one place. Yeah, and, and the other thing I tried to do as well is weave in history, right? So as part, as you know, I've been doing genealogy for so long, you tend to become more of a history buff. I wasn't a history buff in school. I wasn't either. But, <laughs> I hated yeah, it. and then all of a sudden, you know, doing research for this book, I'm watching documentaries on Italians coming to America or the Chinese Exclusion Act or, you know, military stuff, right? Things I would have never even thought about. Yeah. But I felt that I needed to know. And so incorporating history into the book, is something that I've done. And one thing that's kind of interesting that I was talking to people about is in 1840, free people of color were listed. There was a, a scandal, so to speak, with the 1840 census because a lot of free people of color were listed as insane or idiotic or one of those two categories. And the American Statistical Association basically did an investigation because some of the numbers were so high and they were skewed that, that basically free people of color that didn't even live in a town were listed that way. And it was kind of done to give the perception of why African Americans shouldn't be free. Oh, That's wow. something I discovered years ago. Right? I've I mean, never when heard I lived that. in Cambridge. I know. But I thought I thought it was important and that it was unique enough to put in a book because these are the little tidbits of things that help and when you're analyzing, researching, and interpreting a record, right? Right. And that's something that, that you should know. So well, I thought that Yeah, was these funny. stories will often inform what you research, right? And the, the situations exactly. come up and, the, and this timing, and then you, maybe that explains something that you find in a record concerning one of your people. It does, yep. 
Yep. So I tried to put those little things in there as well. And a lot of tips. You know, genealogy can be overwhelming. I mean, that's why people hire me or you or others, right, because it's overwhelming to get started. And I wanted to kind of help guide people down the road and give them something and give them something that's kind of encouraging to say, look, I know it's overwhelming. You're going to go down a rabbit hole. You'll be up to 3 a.m. But understand that this is something that is extremely informative, valuable, and you'll be a different person uh, once you complete this journey. It really is true, isn't it? You're never the same after this stuff because I think what we do is we wind up benefiting from the life lessons of those who came before us. So it's almost like an extension of our own life experience through them. Absolutely. Absolutely. More than names, dates, and places. This gives historical context. This brings them back to life. And then you start to get people talking. And, you know, when I was in Rochester, I went to visit my 92-year-old cousin. I met Marion Sellers Phillips in 2003. And what's interesting about her, it was almost coming full circle. Because in 1996, I wrote to the town clerk. Because back then, you had to write to people to get Yes, I remember that. So, <laughs> so I wrote to the town clerk. Her daughter lived across the street from Marion. Marion provided that first level of information on my mother's family, her maternal side. And it was so interesting because to come full circle and have my book come out and to have her host me in 2003, then to see her in 2016, and again, just to see her a few weeks ago and be at her house and go through the photos. And a lot of the photos that I have are photos that Marianne gave me. So it was really, really cool that I was able to get some time with her. Well, and, and I'm sure she's story. very proud of you, too. All right, so where can people get the book? It's called The Family Tree Toolkit, A Comprehensive Guide to Uncovering Your Ancestry and Researching Genealogy. It's from my guest, Kenyatta Berry. Where can we get it? Well, the book is available online. You can get it at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and it will be hitting bookstores soon. And we went into our second printing before uh, the book wow. came out. So I'm excited about that. Yeah. Well, Kenyatta, okay. this, is, uh, this is a great accomplishment. I'm really excited for you and appreciative, too, because this is a book that needs to be out there. The tidal wave is coming on, especially with DNA and all that's happening. And you're doing great stuff. Thanks for coming on. Great. Thanks for having me. And uh, coming up next, we're going to talk to the director of the Family History Center in Phoenix, Arizona. He's Gene Carruth, and they had a real interesting discovery there that turned into a major adventure. You're going to want to hear about that. Coming up next in five minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Scientific studies have proven that youth who know even a little bit about their family history perform better academically and have a greater sense of personal confidence and stability. Genealogy is its own incredible superpower that arms our children with super strength. But how do you get your child or grandchild interested in studying their family history? That kind of stuff is just for grandmas, right? Not anymore. ZapTheGrandmaGap.com leaps the generation gap in a single bound. Author Janet Havorka provides you with useful and timely advice on helping the young people in your life become engaged in their own family history. Janet has an entire collection of books to inspire the young and the young at heart in fun, interactive ways. She also offers creative tips and advice on her blog and in her free weekly newsletter. Stop by ZapTheGrandmaGap.com today to sign up for Janet's free email newsletter with 52 weeks of easy tips, free downloads, and order your set of resource books and workbooks. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chart Masters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartMasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chart Masters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Master's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history.
Welcome back to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It's Fisher at this end. Your radio root sleuth, and I'm thinking back to a day many years ago when I was a child, and there was a, a local pond in the backwoods of Connecticut where I liked to fish. And this one day, this huge rainstorm came up just as I discovered something in the water. It was an old trunk. And I was convinced there was treasure in that trunk. And somehow I got it out of the lake and through the pouring rain, literally rolled it through the woods and back to my house so I could open it in the garage and discover how rich I was going to be for the rest of my life. Needless to say, there was nothing in it. But there was treasure to be found in a mysterious suitcase that's been brought to the attention of a group of genies in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, we have one of those people on the line right now. He's Gene Carruth. He's the director. It's the Phoenix Family History Center, right, Gene? Right. The Phoenix, Arizona Family History Center, one of the 5,000 centers around the world supported by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Well, when I heard about this story, I just perked up immediately because, you know, mysterious suitcases. Doesn't everybody want to open that up and see what's in there? First of all, how did this come to your attention? We have a patron that came into the Family History Center and said, you know, I've got this old suitcase at home. I've had it for several years. She says, I was at a memorial building where they display the remains for people who have been cremated and there was this old suitcase, and they said they're going to throw it out because they're doing some remodeling. And she looked at it and saw all these photos and documents and said, you can't throw that out. That's a treasure chest of valuable information. So she took it home. She forgot about it for several years and came to see us around 2016, 2017, I think, and said, hey, I've got this. And she explained that. I said, well, bring it in. Let's see what we can do. <laughs> so you get the suitcase. And you've got it. How beat up was this thing? Well, it was an old brown suitcase. The edges were worn and torn a little bit. And obviously it had seen some life. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's seen it better been days. around for a time or two. You sure. Bet. Yeah. I, you know, I was picturing oh, in my mind for some reason alligator skin, you know, <laughs> those old things. Well, were. it was a, kind of a light brown, very nice looking brown suitcase. But well, locks yeah, open? Yeah, it, it had traveled. Locks the open? The locks were available. They're opened. We opened it up. And lo and behold, inside were all these photos, wedding photos. There was report cards from back in 1926. Wow. Photos of people at a World Congress bowling league. <laughs> uh, many, many documents. Okay. So we had a team of about three or four people says, let's tackle it. And I said, well, let's find out who this is and see if we can find an owner. Yeah. And I'll stake dinner to whoever finds the owner. Very nice choice. So you went through these things, obviously, to figure out who the folks were. Were they well marked, first of all? Oh, yes. There were all kinds of documents. There were high school information. So we were very quickly able to identify that this belonged to a lady named Elizabeth Mason Lewis. If she was from Pennsylvania. She had passed away in 2012 and was buried here in, in Arizona. And somehow this suitcase wound up at the memorial building where her remains are. So the next thing was, well, what do we do with it? Yeah. Great material. Let's see if we can find a living person who may be interested. Now, did she have a spouse and kids? What did you find out about she, her personally? She did. She had a spouse. She had children. And one person, Barry Flagg, even built a big pedigree chart on ancestry of a couple of hundred people belonging to this family and the family line. And through that, we were able to find a son of this lady who actually lived in Arizona and was called Surprise, Arizona. Okay. Very familiar with it because of the minor league baseball complex out there. Right. Right. So we put a letter together and identified a number of things that we had found in the suitcase and sent it to him. He got the letter, and his first reaction is, this has got to be a spam. <laughs> Somebody wants to sell me a suitcase. Now, wait, wait a minute. Did you email it, or did you drop it in the mail? We, used, we used snail mail. We mailed it to him and uh, said it was from the Phoenix, Arizona Family History Center, and I signed the letter. 
his wife says, well, look at it and read it. You <laughs> need to call this guy and see what it's all about. You'll know whether it's a scam. And he called us. We explained what we had. And he says, oh, I thought we had all the suitcases. <laughs> Wait a minute. I thought we had all the information. Wait a minute. All the suitcases? Were there more than one? Come to find out, they moved this lady out of her house a couple of times, and she wound up in a assisted living area. And he said, we brought home two or three suitcases of pictures and documents. Wow. Wow. But was they, not aware of this one. They missed one at the yep. memorial place. Somehow it wound up at the memorial place. He was just excited. Yeah, I can when imagine. He, came in, he he saw the suitcase. We opened it up. He started going through the information. And there were some photos of him as a little boy. Oh, how fun. Wow. In the suitcase. I hope you got some so good he, video he on that. Was, we do. We, uh, in fact, the Fox News station locally was there. Unbelievable. They came and they interviewed him. They videoed the thing, and it's out on a website. What was the best picture that was in there? Let's start with the oldest, okay? Oh, there was a wedding photo. So for the lady who died, uh, she was like 83 years old in 2012. So that might have been one of the oldest photos. Mm -hmm. And a lot of family photos. All these series of report cards. She was a great student. A lot of A's. <laughs> did, did, she did well. Well, what a and great there find. pictures of her husband in the, his bowling league. And there's quite a few pictures of he and other bowlers in some big national bowling league. Wow. So is is the son a big genie himself? Does he do a lot of research? Does he organize he has, this? He has not done a lot of research. We uh, showed him the ancestry pedigree chart we developed, and uh, that is now being made available to him and to his sister, who he immediately contacted and sent her a link to the video of opening the suitcase with the news station. And so a lot of his family members apparently have been notified within 24 hours. They knew all about the suitcase. Isn't that great? Isn't that fun? You know, it's one of those really it, uniting things. Has this kind of thing it, happened before in your center? We've had a couple of things like this where we identified some things that were left, but nothing quite as exciting as this one. <laughs> because it was a, a nice big bundle, and, and it probably had several hundred photographs in there of various types. And it told the story to the point we could develop a great pedigree chart and then find the living son and living close. I love that. I love that kind of thing. And, you know, it happens all the time. There's so many people, for instance, who might find just one photograph on eBay and buy it and then find somebody it belongs to on the other side of the country. And and the next thing you know, these these people are putting their history together for them. And I've been the beneficiary of things like that. And then the one who's also provided things like that. In fact, I sent an invitation to a wedding from 1931 to a descendant of that couple just this past week. And so I'm really looking forward to hearing their reaction when they see that because I haven't told them yet (laughs) what they've got coming. Well, Gene, thanks so much for coming on and uh, sharing your story. That's just an incredible thing. I'm sure it's uh, still going to be the talk of the Family History Center there in Phoenix. And uh, we appreciate uh, your coming on and sharing that with us. Well, I appreciate the phone call and the opportunity to share the story. And coming up, it's time to talk preservation. Randy Fredlin in from Vivid Picks for Tom Perry this week, talking about your photographs on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Legacy Tree Genealogist is a proud sponsor of Extreme Genes. Based in Salt Lake City, Utah, near the world's largest family history library, we've worked with genealogists all over the globe since 2004 to track down records, find your ancestors, and the stories that bring your legacy to life. We also analyze DNA test results, help you join lineage societies, and find missing cousins. Legacy Tree is the recommended research partner of MyHeritage.com and is the world's highest client-rated genealogy firm. Call us 
toll free at 1-800-818-1476 or register online to get a free estimate. Right now, you can save up to $100 on professional genealogy research. But hurry, this offer expires at the end of the month. Even experienced researchers can benefit from our proven and experienced staff of specialists who can bring new approaches to old problems. Learn from our free genealogy tips on our blog at LegacyTree.com slash blog. Legacy Tree Genealogists. We do the research. You enjoy the discoveries. Ever wonder where you got your bright green eyes or your infectious laugh? Thanks to technology, discovering your family story has never been easier. And we're bringing it all together at Roots Tech, the world's largest family history conference. Registration for Roots Tech 2019 is open. Join us February 27th through March 2nd for this incredible four-day event at the Salt Palace Convention Center in Salt Lake City, Utah. Learn from over 300 classes on topics such as DNA, capturing family stories, and preserving legacies. For a limited time, take advantage of promotional pricing. Purchase a four-day pass for only $209 if you register before January 25th. That's $90 off a regularly priced pass. Explore over 200 exhibits in the Expo Hall and interact with the latest technology. Join the excitement, join the fun. Discover your family, discover yourself. Discover Roots Tech. February 27th through March 2nd at the Salt Palace Convention Center in Salt Lake City, Utah. Register today at RootsTech.org. Hey, Genies, Fisher here with a shout out to our Patrons Club members at patreon.com slash extreme genes. This is where friends of the show support extreme genes for as little as a dollar a month, all the way up to the cost of a very nice burger each month. I mean, a really juicy one. You can support the show and enjoy various special Patrons Club member benefits, such as acknowledgement on extremegenes.com, special bonus podcasts from expert guests like Maureen Taylor, the photo detective, C.C. Moore, your genetic genealogist, great storytellers and experts on record sets from all over the world. We even offer expert advice on specific questions challenging your research. So go to patreon.com slash extreme genes and get signed up. We love sharing your genealogical journey with you on our Extreme Genes Patrons Club. After all, what would you rather have, inspiring and informative content or another greasy burger? The choice is yours. And thanks for supporting Extreme Genes. Hey, and we're back at it, talking preservation on Extreme Genes, America's family history show and ExtremeGenes.com. I am Fisher, your radio root sleuth. Tom Perry's off this week, and I'm talking to Randy Fredlin from Vivid Picks. And Randy is one of these photographic geniuses that has come up with this great software I've been telling you about called Restore. And I thought today we talk a little bit about why pictures do what they do, Randy. I mean, you've been in this your whole life. You worked for Kodak. What makes pictures fade and change? change colors, and and some pictures do and some pictures don't. Well, to begin with, we have lots of dyes that over the years have changed a great deal. Ah. And unfortunately, even though we look at still pictures in particular and look at them and say, gee, that's a moment in time frozen, it's not quite frozen. What do you mean by Uh, that? Well, what we look at when we're looking at a a picture, let's say a a black and white picture of your great-grandmother, for example, the dyes that are in the paper, in this case, the black dye, is not as permanent as we'd like to think it is. Okay, now you're talking about a certain type of photograph, though. How far back are you looking here? Basically back to the beginning of photographic time. Okay. Um, In the 50s, color dyes came out, which provided a whole new slew of problems because in the rush to get things to market, the providers of color paper provided dyes that were not quite as color fast as we might like. As compared to the old black and white ink from great grandma's time? Exactly. Those black and white shots last a whole lot better. Although they do fade, they're not as bad as the early color pictures. Yeah. Yeah, that would make sense. I was just looking at one the other day, and it it just kind of turned red for some reason, and it dated back to the 60s somewhere in there. And I would imagine that was when uh, some of that paper was out, yes? Yes, that's part of it. The other great deal of effect is how that picture was stored. Okay. So if that picture was stored at zero degrees and 40% humidity under Yucca Mountain, then it's probably doing really well. (laughs) So it really depends, obviously, where you live. 
right? And humidity right. and temperature, whether your closet is up against an outdoor wall, all those things that we often talk about here. I mean, they can really not only mess up the color and the contrast and the fading, but can also just destroy the paper itself. Uh, yeah, if the humidity is wrong, the paper can become brittle. Also, you know, you, you uh, get in your time machine and go back and make sure that they're not using any acid-based papers. <laughs> or There's all kinds of things that can go wrong, not only on the basis of the paper, but the color dyes within and also whatever you've stored those photos in. And probably with as well, right? I mean, other paper around it maybe that had some acid in it. If you were to, to pick one place in the United States and say, boy, the ideal place to store your photographs, I mean, assuming you keep it in a reasonably constant temperature and humidity, where would that place be? International Falls, Minnesota. Really? Why? <laughs> Well, it's probably colder than it needs to be, but in order to do the uh, accelerated testing for longevity of dyes, heat is always applied, right. and it's the cumulative effect. And what happens for testing of photographic materials is they subject them to high heat and high humidity. So the uh, the reverse is pretty much what you'd like to see for storage. So you want someplace a little chillier with reasonable sure. humidity, but not too much. Yeah, and not too much sun. You want your pictures in the dark, except when you're looking at them. Okay, so that's the color and the dyes. Uh, are we talking similar effects based on fading and contrast? Yeah, actually what happens is if you imagine little bits of red, green, and blue in your pictures, yeah, they don't stay as dark as you'd like them to be. They change. They get lighter. They are no longer as dark as originally printed. And so... Not only does that change the colors, it changes the contrast as well. Wow. And obviously, you guys have come up with a solution. We'll talk a little more about that in the next segment and why it is our pictures go the way they go. We'll have that coming up in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show and ExtremeGenes.com. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chartmasters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartmasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chartmasters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Master's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. When was the last time you heard your grandmother's voice or saw your family enjoying life back in the 1950s or 60s? If the reason is you haven't known what to do with your old recordings, videos, and films, here's your answer. The Multimedia Center in Salt Lake City. We brought in a video project to the Multimedia Center, and overnight, they duplicated it to DVD so we could meet our deadline. The Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to Transfer Duplication. Com. Genies, it's Fisher with exciting news. The Weekly Genie, the official newsletter of Extreme Genes, is here. It's your Monday morning briefing on what's happening in the world of genealogy and family history and on Extreme Genes. Get all the details of jaw-dropping stories of discovery and keep up with the latest techniques in family history research. Get to know more about your favorite Extreme Genes personalities. And it's free. Sign up for The Weekly Genie now at ExtremeGenes.com or the Extreme Genes Facebook page. And when you do, you'll receive David Allen Lambert's top 10 tips for beginning genealogists from the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society. Sign up today for the Weekly Genie. All 
right, we're back at it for our final segment this week on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show and ExtremeGenes.com. Fisher here talking to Randy Fredlin. He's with Vivid Picks, the creators of the great software we've been telling you about called Restore. And uh, Randy, it, it's amazing to dig into your head about how our pictures get destroyed before we could actually use your software to restore them. And you mentioned during the break here something about a slinky. How does that apply to a photograph? Well, I like to think of the different channels, meaning the different colors in any photograph as corresponding to a slinky. The metal ones, not the plastic ones. Yeah, that's right. The metal ones ones are are much better. Yes, they are. (laughs) The ones that could climb down the stairs without your help. Now, if you take a slinky and think of the, let's just use black and white for the moment, the whitest white as being one end of the color spectrum or the tone scale, the other end of the slinky being black, When that print is printed, if it's properly printed, your slinky will be stretched across the entire length from white to black. Am I making sense here? Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. And, And what happens as time goes on, that part of the slinky that was white gets sullied, if you will, and becomes less white. And the part that was black in particular becomes less black. So instead of having a slinky nicely stretched across the the whole range that it's supposed to be, now your slinky is compressed down into a much smaller space. So you've created this uh, software called Restore from Vivid Picks. How do you take that and, and make it work? How do you basically stretch out the slinky again? Well, part of what we do is we take the scan that you provide and read it into our software and a portion of what we're doing is contrast expansion. So we take what is no longer white, it's where the top of your slinky is, and expand that out to what is really white. And then we take the bottom of the slinky and expand that down to where it's really black. And in between, all those other spirals on the slinky get correspondingly expanded back to the appropriate places along the whole tone scale. Okay, now now we're talking just black and white, or do you also manage color in the same way? Color's a little different, but there are some similarities in that now instead of a single slinky for just black and white, now there's three slinkies. Let's just use red, green, and blue. If you have a red slinky and a green slinky and a blue slinky, what you'll see is that, yes, they've all been compressed from what they should be from white to black, meaning from completely no red to all the red you could possibly put in the right. in the paper, and no green to all the green and no blue to all the blue, and they've all been compressed. But part of the issue here is they've all been compressed differently. They're not the same, so you can't use a single fix in order to make your entire color picture come back to life. With Restore, though, you can. Right. But I'm saying that what we did for uh, black and white, just a simple contrast expansion, that's a little oversimplified when you get to fixing color. Wow. Well, it's amazing what your software does. Uh, I love it. We talk about it all the time. It's Restore from Vivid Picks. And I appreciate what you're doing for our Extreme Genes listeners, too, making 10 pictures available to be fixed for free through Restore from Vivid Picks. And all they got to do is go to vivid com slash Extreme Genes. And you're right there, and you can test it out and test drive it. Great work, Randy. Strong stuff. Thanks so much for coming on, and appreciate the slinky explanation. No problem. And unfortunately, I'm the guy at the end of the support line, me and Cindy. So we're there to help you if you need it. <laughs> All right. Great stuff. Thanks so much. Randy Fredland, he's from Vivid Picks. And I never thought I'd be talking slinkies on this show. Well, that's it for this week. Thanks so much for joining us. Hey, don't forget to sign up for our weekly Genie newsletter. It's free. Take a look. It's on ExtremeGenes.com. We don't just share your email address with anybody. And we do share lots of links to great stories and past shows and my blog every week. And you can also sign up to support the show through our patron club. Go to Patreon.com slash Extreme Genes. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family. Yeah.